Three. Uh, thank you for continuing this discussion with me. This is Professor EBM, and we're discussing alcohol withdrawal syndromes. And we're going to proceed to case number three, which is more complicated than the first two cases that we discussed. You are on the medicine consult service when you are asked by the orthopedic surgeons to evaluate a 71-year-old man who is agitated in tachycardia three days following an open reduction internal fixation of a right hip fracture. On exam, he is diaphoretic and disoriented. His pulse is 142, blood pressure 181 over 97, temperature of 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and a respiratory rate of 19. His general exam shows only a mild right lower extremity swelling, and his neurologic exam is notable for disorientation and tremor, but it is otherwise normal. He is highly agitated, yelling, swinging his fist wildly at you and the nurses. The nurses then bring you a copy of the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Alcohol Evaluation, says that he scored high on this and requests that you order diazepam for his withdrawal syndrome. So the first question is, you can call to see this patient, would you treat this patient with benzodiazepine? Right away, would you, would you follow the nurse's order? No. Bill, good, no. I agree with you, why is that? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of different causes for why this patient could be altered and disoriented and diaphoretic. Uh, he's immediately post-op, he's on a PCA, um, you know, elderly person in the hospital for three days, not getting much sleep, those are all. Yes, yes. So give me some other ideas of what the differential diagnoses might be. What other diagnosis might be causing his delirium? Infection. Good. Infection, absolutely. Metabolic, oh, metabolic abnormality? Yes, electrolytes. Could be hypoxic from a pee. Absolutely. Even if it says he's satting 92%, we've had plenty of patients when their PO2 is actually 55 or 59. So absolutely. Uh, embolus, pulmonary embolus, acute infection, even acute MI. But certainly hidden infections would be part of it. So you're being very thoughtful and thorough. Now let's say... Uh, a couple hours go by, you've done chest x-ray, you've done all these, the PSEM is normal, the ABG shows that he's oxygenated fine, uh, and there's no other evidence that, that immediately, in the first couple hours, suggests that he's got a secondary diagnosis. But what other information can you look at to, to find out whether he does have a drinking history or not? Give me some ideas where else you might look. The chart? Absolutely, look in the chart. And let's say that there are some hints that he had alcohol intake, but there's no good documentation. This is his first time in this hospital, and maybe his daughter, who dropped him off, brought him to the hospital initially, commented on some drinking. And here it is, 11 o'clock at night, and the chart doesn't really help you. What other thing can you do? Could call a family member. Absolutely. Please call the family member and dig up that information. Because the concern is, and there has been a study on this at the Mayo Clinic, that we inappropriately use the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Scale for patients who are, one, too sick to answer questions. If they're nonverbal, we can't do it. And in fact, this uh, informatic, the Institute Withdrawal Scale was used on moderately uh, withdrawal patients, not medically ill patients. So if they have medical comorbidities or if they can't speak to you, you have to be very careful in applying that. In fact, we may end up misapplying that. So looking through the chart, you note that the patient sustained a fracture following an uh, MVA in which he was booked for driving under the influence. His inpatient medications include anoxaparin, diphenhydramine, insomnia, and sure enough, a morphine sulfate PCA pump. So that was a very good point. Uh, his labs reveal a white blood count of 11,500. The sodium is 132. The potassium is 3.4. Uh, the total bilirubin movement is 0 0.4. And his AST is 169. Now his O2 sat is 96% on room air, his chest x-ray is negative, and EKG is a sinus tack, but no signs of ischemia. ST is normal, no OQ waves. So I'm, putting, I'm presenting it to you now that this 71-year-old gentleman, three days out from his drinking, is in fact probably having withdrawal syndrome. So now, would any of you treat this patient with benzodiazepines? And if so, which benzo would you use and how would you dose it? What supportive measures might you start? So let's go back to our choices between a long acting and a short acting. And given this elderly person with some liver problems, would that affect your choice? 
Yes, Josh. I'd be more inclined to, to start with the short acting, see if that actually improves his symptoms. If it doesn't improve it, then it's not going to stick around forever. If it does, then you know that you're probably on the right path, and then you can choose something Good. else after that. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. The delirium that he shows, the tremors, he has autonomic uh, hyperactivity, so I would cautiously use some uh, Ativan. But the thing is, you should make sure he's in a place where he's going to be observed because we've had the cases where you give them the first dose of Ativan and they become less uh, responsive and the respiratory rate goes down, and often requiring uh, respiratory support. So there is, some, there is strong uh, experiential evidence to give the benzodiazepine to a patient like this but recognize that we don't have evidence-based medicine in terms of controlled trials to support this. But it's still recommended that we go ahead and do that. Now, have any of you used midazolam or IV Versed for these folks for withdrawal? Has anyone used it? No? Good. <laughs> there actually was a time in the early 90s when a lot of people received IV midazolam. It's a very short-acting benzodiazepine that actually an uh, anesthesiologists use and uh, people do use it prior to a procedure. It turns out that we experienced, and again, this is without evidence-based study, but we experienced a large number of these patients ending up with prolonged ICU stays due to IV midazolam. And we think it changes the pharmacokinetics after we saturate the receptors. And actually, the patients went into a coma, probably secondary to the midazolam. So we do rec recognize that there are problems with ultra-short-acting uh, agents, but using lorazepam, doing it carefully, supporting IV and correcting this person's metabolic and electrolyte uh, disorders. You just have to be ready to support them for the respiratory status if you do that. So are neuroleptics a useful adjunct for treating this patient's delirium? And this is the point where let's say we've given them some uh, benzodiazepines and uh, you've controlled some of the tachycardia maybe, but let's say he's still very delirious and acting out wildly and trying to climb out of bed. Uh, Grace, would you use neuroleptics? Have you used them? I have. Um, in patients who have received the appropriate benzodiazepines, I have given a little bit of Haldol, like 0.5 or 1 milligram, to yeah. see if it helps the delirium. Yes. It can help with the delirium. Has any, do you know what uh, complications you have to watch out for with the Haldol? Prolonged QT. Right. We've had that. And then if you mix it with certain other medications, it can make the QT syndrome even worse. And what does uh, Haldol do to the seizure threshold? Lowers it. So that's why we usually don't recommend on alcohol withdrawal using Haldol until after there's been enough or some benzodiazepines put on board. And then with this wild tachycardia, what about giving a beta blocker? Would you use it or have you used it for that? No, um, so for sinus tachycardia, you just normally treat the underlying problem, which is the alcohol withdrawal, so I wouldn't treat the heart rate with the beta blocker. And I would agree with that. Uh, there's been no studies to support beta blockers being good for delirium. It will block, again, the tachycardia. But in fact, may mask the fact that you're not giving them enough benzodiazepines. So we recommend not giving propranolol. But we do support using the uh, benzodiazepines judiciously, uh, cautiously, and under observation because these patients may suffer respiratory consequences. That was excellent.